Christine Kennedy, and on behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening as we hear from three terrific McMaster authors who are going to share with you some of the inspirations they have used to craft the stories they have put on paper. Given this webinar is a McMaster event, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that the land the McMaster campus is on and the land that I'm on at my home here in Ancaster sits on the um, the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee territory nations, excuse me, Haudenosaunee nations, and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon, one spoon wampum agreement. Uh, making this land acknowledgement today is particularly fitting given our topics of stories, because for too long, we tried to stop Indigenous peoples from telling their stories. And part of meaningful change that comes from truth and reconciliation is acknowledging the dark history that settlers have inflicted on our Indigenous peoples. But looking to the future, we can acknowledge the past and we should uh, learn and appreciate the many, in, many Indigenous stories that surround us and uh, take the time to learn those. So it is with uh, great pleasure I uh, would like to um, introduce our panel, Jamie Tennant, uh, who is moderating tonight. Uh, he will be moderating and our two alumni authors are Farzana Doctor and Terry Favreau. I've had the pleasure of working with all three of them in the past and I'm thrilled that they're here tonight virtually. I've always worked with them in person, uh, but tonight we're virtually coming to you uh, to talk about where do stories come from. Jamie is the author of two novels. His latest was just released this month, and he's the host and producer of the weekly program Get Lit. Rosanna Doctor is the author of four novels, and she just recently published her latest uh, book, which is a work of poetry. And uh, Terry Favreau has released four novels and also a work of nonfiction. And her latest uh, book was also released this year. So we have some great questions that were pre-submitted that we're going to get to. And we hope that this talk tonight will inspire many of you to put your stories to paper. Jamie, take it away. Hey everybody, how's it going? Um, as uh, CK said, I'm Jamie. I'm super excited to be here with Farzana and Terry, uh, both of whom I've at least met once in the past. Um, although uh, time has no meaning anymore, obviously, what with the pandemic making everything seem a little strange. But one thing we've done a lot of in the last couple of years is enjoyed stories, whether it's been on film or whether it's been, uh, you know, in the book form that we're talking about tonight. So the title of tonight is Where Do Stories Come From? And that's a big question. So we're going to start with it and we're going to try to break it down from there. And uh, I think you'll be surprised that the answers are, are many. There's no one way this works. So Farzana, if I had to ask you the question, where do stories come from? What's your response? Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so all over the place, but um, I would say there are three doors that um, stories come from for me. One is kind of current events, things that are happening around me in the world, sometimes within my own community. So that's the first door. And then the second door is something that is like from my deep subconscious. And um, I'll tell a little tiny story about that. So um, my second novel, um, Six Meters of Pavement, involves a particular experience. Um, I thought I was writing that experience um, through the lens of something I had read in the newspaper. Um, it's about a hot car death, so a child who dies in a car. And when my father was reading the book later on, he asked me, so did your mom ever tell you about this, the time when you were a baby? And then, you know, my hair stood up and I realized that I had been writing about an experience that had been a baby time experience for me when I had no conscious memory of um, an experience no one had ever told me about ever. Um, but I was really preoccupied about the concept. So that's door number two. Door number three, I think, is um, a place where things come through in maybe a more spiritual kind of way. Um, who knows? Um, but uh, for example, with my third novel, I had been really, really stuck. I had given um, myself a big break from it. And one day, as I was riding my bike down a very steep hill, I heard a voice in my head saying, I am your missing character. 
and here's my backstory. And I didn't want to write any of that, um, but I started to incorporate that voice into the story and um, it changed everything for me. So those are my three doors through which things come through. And the last you, is Terry? my favorite. Yeah, the last is some of the best. I, I, hopefully I'll remember to add something to that to that kind of thing. But Terry, I, you have, uh, again, uh, different sources for where your yeah. stories come from. Yeah, well, I, I like Farzana saying there are three doors. It's a little mm -hmm. bit like a game show, right? And that's a little, like <laughs> writing a book can be like you open a door and you don't know what's behind it till you go very far in. Um, for me, the first two books, which were written almost 10 years ago now, were really... Um, they came out of stories that I had heard around the supper table. I grew up in uh, what's now St. Catharines, used to be called Grantham Township, the sort of a rural industrial part of Niagara, eventually absorbed into St. Catharines. And it was a, it was a you know, 100% immigrant neighborhood, um, mostly Italians, Ukrainians, Poles, and also the the black families who were descended from uh, the Underground Railroad days um, live in that part, or lived in that part of St. Catharines. And the sort of mix of people and our proximity to the border and the fact that everybody had come from somewhere else fairly recently meant that there were a lot of stories in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. both in my family and other people's families. And what struck me, I think, as an adult looking back on them was the epic nature of them. I mean, I, I think a lot of the time we sort of hear these sort of stories of migration and they seem very familiar from watching movies or, you know, just sort of some, you know, one of your relatives telling them to you. But it always seemed that in my family that the stories would get heightened. They would take on this very operatic, almost magic realist kind of feeling. And so when I started writing books, and I'm mean, even writing, you know, shorter pieces originally, I really drew on that a lot. Um, in later years, more recently, the work that I've done is, is speculative fiction. And a lot of that is based on my experiences growing up in that area of Ontario during the early years of the Cold War. Um, when we were constantly being told, if, there's, if, there's, if they drop the bomb, we'll be the first to go because of our proximity to the Niagara Falls hydro station, which was a first strike target in, in those days, mm. in the 60s and 70s. So that really kind of had a big impact on me growing up. We actually expected that either there would be a nuclear war or we would go live on the moon. Those kind of were the two options and neither one happened. So I started playing around with um, speculative fiction stories that presuppose that maybe those things really did happen, but they happened in an alternate universe. Um, and the third thing that um, has really influenced actually a lot of things that I've written, both my nonfiction book and the most recent novel, which is called mm -hmm. The Sister Sputnik, is that my father was a um, Kind, kind of fell in love with an early industrial robot that he worked with at a car factory in St. Catharines in 1968 and started to write fake purchase orders. He was sort of the appointed technician. He was an electrician, but they didn't know who should be looking after this robot. So he would, he would write purchase orders and, and get you know parts that were supposed to be for fixing this industrial robot and bring them home and build robots in our house. So these three things <laughs> have kind of fueled five books um, and, and some graphic novels that I've actually worked on with my collaborator. So that's kind of where, where the <laughs> spot is for me. Um, and okay. Jamie, I'm, I'm going to throw that question back at you because I just finished River Diverted, which Thank I you. loved, and um, which is set in Japan. And right. so... So you have to explain where that came from. <laughs> well, I think I kind of do, actually, though. For, for me, um, it, it's kind of an unsatisfying question to answer because I think it'll, it's been different every time. And I think it'll change again, you know, for the next thing that I decide to write. Um, with River Diverted, I uh, lived in Japan for a while and uh, worked in the bar. I even kept the bar's name the same uh, that's in the book sort of as a tribute to the fellow who owned and operated it and gave us a chance to come and experience this uh, this 
living in another country in my 20s, you know, so formative. And I always wanted to tell that story, but there's no story, right? Like, it's just mm -hmm. uh, memories, and no one wants to read my memoir. Like, I haven't, nothing exciting happened, uh, unless you're me. Uh, so sometimes you just have something you want to express, and then the story, like, how what you can wrap those memories into the story, the plot itself, comes kind of just as an inspiration out of, out of nowhere, and you're not even sure. One day, I was writing this book, and... And suddenly I envisioned this main character and for some reason I just thought it'd be really cool she wrote monster movies for a living and boom it just took off from there and I realized how I could take these scenes of my everyday experience in Japan and put them as uh, a backdrop in a setting for uh, for an actual plot so it was it was just a fantastic thing but that was different from every other book I've written as well. So um, you kind of uh, have to just go with the inspiration of the moment, which kind of leads into the next question. Uh, there's a famous thing that writers are always asked, and that is, um, which camp are you? Are you a planner or a pantser? And what that means is, to people who don't know, are you the person who writes an outline that's very, very uh, careful to hew to that outline as you go, or are you making it up as you, as you go along? Um, because depending on which it is, you can have a very different type of story uh, and a story that surprises yourself if you're not knowing where the story is going to go. Um, Barzana, do you fit into either camp wholly? Uh, and do you know, how much of your story do you know when you write those first yeah. words on the page? You know, I wish I was a plotter. I think that the people who are plotters I feel like they might have like a better process or might like have an easier time. They might um, get lost less, but that's just not how I write. And I, I have tried different methods, but I really am a pantser. So I write as I go. What I do usually have in my head in advance is what I think the story arc is going to be. So I might even write um, like back jacket copy for myself. Um, as a way to describe what is this book. And of course, I will move away from that um, because it's not much of a, it's not much of a plan, right? It's like a <laughs> hundred words. <laughs> um, but I, I do like to have a sense of like, what's the point of this story? Or what do I think is the point as I'm starting off? Oh. And then I get wildly lost. <laughs> what do you think, Terry? Um, well, I'm going to say me too. Um, <laughs> to the wildly lost part? Or to, uh, yeah. all, to well, all of it. I, I'm definitely not an outliner. Um, I do have a sense of what I want the story to do. I, I basically treat, um, if you will, planning the book. I suppose that would be a good way to put it. Well, first, first of all, uh, Farzana's method of, of doing a summary, like what, what you might call an elevator pitch. The hundred word description, you know, the thing when somebody meets you and say, oh, you're a writer, what's your book about? And you can't stand there and sort of go on for two. So you have to boil it down to 20 words. That's a very good way to distill what it is you want to write over 100,000 words. Um, I also tend to treat my books as thought experiments. So what pushes my books forward is a what if question. So for example, um, the book I just wrote, The Sister Sputnik and the book that preceded it, which was called Sputnik's Children, was, are both kind of out, coming out of the same thought experiment. And that is, what if there actually was a nuclear war, but nobody knew because it was in an alternate world? So that's the, that's the question. So mm -hmm. then I spend the rest of the time answering it. And that actually, you know, it's it's not an outline, but it's sort of a guiding principle, and I find that works better for me. Okay, yeah, yeah. I uh, I can't. I'm actually a little bit of a planner. I'm I'm uh, I'm the odd person out here. Not like I'm, it's like I have a map, but I don't know what road I'm going to take to get to the final location. Uh, I'm not following the Google Maps route. I'm just like, there it is. There I go. And uh, but I do tend to have an idea at least. 
a couple chapters ahead of where I'm going. My fog lights are on. I can see down the road a little farther. But uh, definitely it's um, it, it's a challenge because sometimes, as you know, your subconscious kind of pipes up. And even if you aren't uh, planners, it's still the same thing. You might be pretty sure where you're going. And something comes up and changes changes course now, as a someone who plans i kind of need to just accept that that's going to happen and and be willing to go with it what about you are there ever points in in the writing process where you actually wrestle a little bit with like no no it's supposed to go this way uh no but what i'm wanting to write is going another direction does that does that happen Terry, you're saying it does oh yeah all the time well in fiction it does i mean I guess nonfiction is a whole other, that's a whole other sure. narrative, narrative nonfiction yeah. is still storytelling, but it's a little bit different. But in, yeah, absolutely, um, early on, and again, this is going back to the first book, which was called The Proxy Bride. Um, I had a character um, who was actually based on, a, on someone my parents used to talk about from their childhood, who had the rather unfortunate nickname of Bum Bum, probably because its parents used him as a bit of a prop they used to go around with this little boy and say oh you know I don't have any money to have a little boy but so I guess he, the whole thing became that he they were bumming money using this child this is during the depression and I really became interested in that my version of bum bum over <laughs> over the course of that book I had killed him off originally and then I realized that I really missed him after he was gone <laughs> So I brought him back and outside of the nonfiction book, I have managed, Bum Bum has been a character in one way or another in every single book that I've written. <laughs> so, you know, so yes, I have brought the dead back to life for that very reason. <laughs> is that something that, that you wrestle with, Rosanna, or is it, is it come a little easier for you? I kind of enjoy when um, the novel changes course, like when you do like a sharp right turn, uh, because usually that's because some better idea has arisen and I'm, I've been struggling with something like, like for that example I gave about, you know, my third novel and I was so stuck and then I got this voice in my head and I just went with it and I ended up throwing out so many pages, inserting this guy's story instead and it, like, so that was quite a joyful thing. I'm also thinking with my, um, with my last novel, Seven, um, my agent, Rachel Latovsky, made some suggestions for how the ending might be more powerful. And um, so that was, that was, you know, a sharp left turn at that point. And at first I was like, no, 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 no. This is going to be, it's going to be hard. I don't know if I want to do this. But, you know, when you, when you get this kind of feedback, you know, so maybe that's door number four, in fact, <laughs> um, you get, you get feedback or yeah. suggestions um, and they're good ones. You go with it and then you realize like how the story just got much more powerful. So um, I, I kind of like it when those things arrive. Yeah, and that's great. I mean, these people are meant to be on your team, right? Uh, uh, editors and, and agents, they just want to make the work as good as it can be. So you do have to be open to that fourth door to realize these people are, are, are operating with you in mind, you know? Um, another thing that can move a story in different directions is, of course, your characters. Um, and characters have a funny way, as we get to know them, as we create them, we kind of create them and get to know them at the same time, I think. And suddenly, where you thought things were going to go, you're like, no, I realize now this character wouldn't do that, or doesn't do that, or is in the wrong field of work, whatever. They tell you sometimes, which is sort of sounds like very writer speak, but it's very, very true. Um, is that something now, as people who are sort of going with the inspiration in the moment, do you allow your, you must allow your characters to be part of that inspiration, right? In, in terms of where they're making the plot or the story go for them. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. They are end up taking some lead. And I find that that starts to happen once I'm like, I don't know, at least a quarter or a third into the book. And um, they've started to really have shape in my brain. Um, so then it'll be like, no, I think they would actually do A, B or C instead of what I had thought. And that's also fun information. 
I don't know if that's ever happened uh, to you. You're asking the question, but I'm wondering, like, did that happen for your last book? Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, my last book was really weird, actually, because that story started off with a male narrator who was just, he's kind of in the role, Terry, you've read the book, and kind of in the role of Daniel. And oh, right. one day, okay. not only did I realize I had the wrong person in the story telling the story, I suddenly had this person who had a whole different outlook on life. It was like everything changed from that point on, um, which was really, really really strange but kind of thrilling and comes back again to being knowing when to let it go a little bit right terry like just knowing yeah. when to go all right this person's voice i created it and i trust it i'm going to go in that direction yeah i mean i found i, I have a tendency to really hang on to my characters as you can probably tell from Bum Bum <laughs> being in four novels um i've actually written two like i the four novels are Two, two, well, there's two sets of sequels, if you will. So the characters, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had a, whole, a set of characters that have existed in two different books and I've had that twice. So sometimes I, I really hang on to people once I kind of invent them. Um, I find the characters really do kind of lead the story. I, I mean, in a funny way, I, I know there is this, I know some writers will will approach um, a story by actually doing character development first and figuring out who is it I want to write about. I find it really hard to disassociate characters from story. It's almost like, you know, they are characters because they have a story. Um, but they, I think um, they really kind of guide where things go. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I think so. Um, another thing that would guide where things go too is um, a personal experience. Actually, um, that was actually a question someone brought up, like the whole "write what you know" thing. Right. Um, I think that's a bit of a cliche, but obviously has a, a, an enormous truth in that cliche. Um, do you uh, like? Do all your stories come from personal experience? Like I know I've, I've read your works and I know that a lot of it is, but how do you know, how do I put this? Because I had to do it with my book, right? How do you know um, what parts of your personal experience are worthy of going on the page, whereas stuff that you go, know, actually, maybe that's not part of the story. It's maybe not interesting or a bit of a digression or, or what have you. Um, but how does it work for you with writing what you know, Farzana? Like, is it, uh, yeah. uh, like looking at your work, it seems that like you do, but obviously in many ways you do not. Um, yeah. How does it work for you? So every book has been different, but I really liked what you had said about, you know, you, you had that memory of that time of working in the bar in Japan. And there was something about that that was so compelling to you. And then you had to create a story around it. Um, I did that for my first novel. I, I was really very interested in talking about the setting and that's where I started. And um, so that was the part that I knew. There, were, there was actually a lot of Toronto, um, Toronto places that I knew in that first novel. Mm -hmm. And because, because it was also my first novel, I really, um, I really led with what I knew. So one of the characters, I'm, I'm a psychotherapist in the afternoon. I had a psychologist character um, in that book. And I thought, you know, maybe these are some ways that I won't make mistakes if I'm writing what I know. But I have really enjoyed leaving that with all the subsequent novels. And I have much more fun when I write characters that are so different from me. I think I feel freer. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, um, the last that I have, a, I have a book that is... Um, close to getting a book contract right now and cool. um it's a YA novel yeah hopefully next week there'll be an announcement but nice. it's a YA novel and um I had an experience when I was 15 that was um I, I spent one year at a boarding school and it was a very weird year in my life and that has, has really stayed with me so I've used the boarding school some of the um people I met um 
influenced or inspired some of the side characters. And I used a little teeny bit of who I was as a 15 year old to uh, build one of the main characters. And then it all becomes fiction outside of that. So uh -huh, uh -huh. that would be a place of starting with the personal but then really exploding out into imagination. Yeah. Uh, Terry, I feel like your stuff, I mean, you actually kind of already touched on the things that inspired you that came from your own life, but you don't write about them as, <laughs> like, what you've told us in the Sister Sputnik is very different from what actually happened in your life, even yeah, if the location is the same. I, I haven't, no, I haven't destroyed my my world and, and moved everybody into, <laughs> into this, you know, like on quantum journeying into this world. You know, when you write speculative fiction, it's a little different. However, I, I mean, my, my experience, I think, with all of the books is, is a little bit like Farzana's in that there is a little nugget of, of real experience, but it's more not so much the actual factual things that happen. It's more what you were talking about, Jamie, when, about sort of it's almost more like the, the sensory thing of like you, you were talking about being in Japan and just trying to capture the essence of it. It's more that the, I will say, though, I mean, I've written nonfiction again, which then you're in a whole other world because then you are basing, and part of that was memoir and part of it was based on research where I went out and talked to actual roboticists working today. So, but it's a piece of narrative nonfiction. So in that situation, obviously I'm, I'm part of the story. You can <laughs> see me going around to Carnegie Mellon and that kind of thing and speculating about what it'll be like when we have self-driving cars, et cetera. So it's a little bit different. But I will tell you that there was an incident that happened in my real life um, when I was in high school uh, in St. Catharines, when the um, Amchitka underground nuclear tests were held, I think in 1972, when my high school um, faked a nuclear attack, faked a nuclear, like they convinced for about five minutes the school population that we were under nuclear attack around the time that Amchitka was going on. As a, con as a consciousness raising exercise. And um, it, it, like, it, it, was, it was quite convincing for a few minutes we figured that was it. And I've actually have used that in Sputnik's children. And I, people are quite surprised when they find out that that's actually one part of the book that's absolutely true. Um, <laughs> so I actually have had the experience of very briefly thinking that I was about to be vaporized. And that, so that, that shows up a lot in a lot of different ways. <laughs> I've never really gotten over that. Well, it's amazing because I guess I kind of phrased this question to start, like how do we make the choices of what we may include from our, our lives? Uh, one of the questions that we actually had submitted to us was, um, you know, with endless options for a story's plot and characters, like how do you navigate telling your story without getting lost in choices? Like, you know, especially if you're not uh, outlining at any given juncture, you could make one of who knows how many different choices. And how do you how do you navigate that? How do you know what are the right choices to make? Sometimes that you don't know, I think. Um, I, I think sometimes you end up going off in the wrong direction and uh -huh. then you have to pull yourself back or you you write from the the wrong narrator or you definitely like you have to change your pov somewhere along the line or you have to change your 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 tense from past to present like i think sometimes it is an experiment although if you do have the synopsis or the back cover copy already written you do have a sense of like you are working within some kind of a container mm -hmm. and so you know some choices will just sound too wild I think. Yeah, yeah, Terry. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think you do you do run down blind alleys sometimes, but you know the thing is that people who are plotters also have that happen to them. I've heard of writers who had a, have a whole book planned and outlined, and then realized as they were writing it that it wasn't working and did oh. something else. So sometimes actually even planning it out doesn't really stop you from finding that you have to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But I but I think that you know what Farzana is calling the back the back cover copy and with what I call the thought experiment does kind of guide me when I'm writing it you know it, it all has to be kind of moving toward um, 
a certain, you know, a certain conclusion or a certain court course of events. I also find too that I, I kind of go by what I find most fun to write or most entertaining for myself. I almost feel like I'm writing it for myself. Um, I mean, and the other thing too, is you really don't have endless choices. I think that one of the things that gets tricky if you're writing strictly out of your own experience, for example, if you're writing something that's very autobiographical, uh -huh. um, is that you can get caught up in trying to capture the accuracy of your memories on the page. And oftentimes our memories and our lived experience make for good anecdotes, but they may not make for a great story. And so, you know, that that is something that you, and I would say that's true of memoir too, that you really have to be careful to construct what you're working with so that it is entertaining, engaging, mm -hmm. um, there's a point, you know, <laughs> um, and sometimes if you're just writing, if you're just journaling or you're just trying to write down memories, usually there isn't that kind of constructed um, sort of manufacturing the story has to happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that is, that is, so I guess that's one, one way to answer the question is that you always have to think about what is it I'm really writing about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you both brought up the whole idea of having to sometimes be willing, like to, you know, have written a bunch and then just realize you're going the wrong way. And another submitted question was along those lines. They wanted to know, have you in your experience ever had a fundamental thing in the story change it's like once you're well into the process? And if, if that happened, what were the results? <laughs> like, I, I know it's happened to me. I can think of uh a quick story when I was writing my first novel, The Captain of Canoel Hill, um, I had based a, a character on a real person, never to do that if if they're still alive and around, uh, because when I insisted we send it to them for uh, an okay, I got a big no, no, don't want that to happen. So I had to rewrite this entire part of the book. It was a fairly important part too, but I created a new character, a better character, a character who kind of fit more thematically who the main character could be they played off one another and the result was it was it was way better for the book uh, and i'm wondering if you have any any stories like that either of you um i do i actually told this story in another webinar not too long ago so it's fresh um <laughs> in my very first book that is called the proxy bride um and that one was the was very sort of again the sort of operatic fairy tale version of the of the neighborhood that I grew grew up in um and I had really conceived the book as something of a magic realist book there was a character it was a, quite a major character in the book who was a ghost and um he's alive in one part of the book and then he dies and then he sort of he becomes kind of a you know a spiritual advisor or a, or a, you know a, a guiding angel sort of for the main character Marcello who is the, the main character in the proxy bride and um the book was actually won a prize before it was published and that was how it got published it was in this you know some pub sometimes publishers do that uh -huh. and the editor said you know love the book but you gotta lose the ghost <laughs> because so, uh, and I'm like, why do I have to? Well, it kind of turned out that that particular editor really did not like things that weren't completely mimetic, kind of, mm. you know, that had that kind of more magic realist element. He liked the rest of the book, but he didn't like that. So I, that was, so I actually did remove that character. How did that turn out? Well, the book was well received. Um, I think that the, the, when it was reviewed, a lot of people commented that it had a magic realist feel to it even though the ghost wasn't in there anymore so somehow that kind of still came came through I kind of mourned that I did that mm -hmm. you know I did it because you know it was my first book and I was really being pushed to do that so I did it I don't know if I'd do that again I think like some, there are times when I actually think about going back and rewriting that book wow. and putting that character back in so oh, yeah. man that's yeah. big, actually. <laughs> I want. I probably won't, but I, but I'm very. It would take a lot. It's true. It's it true. would take a lot, but I'm very tempted. I'll go with you first. You know, just just just. I haven't had except for that one experience where I talked mm -hmm. about earlier. 
I haven't had big changes, but I'm just thinking about what Terry talked about. And I've had in a couple of books, the suggestion to tone down the magic realism, mm -hmm. um, which is really interesting, right? Because, you know, so many of us, um, you know, come from families where there is plenty of magic, there's plenty of spirituality, there's plenty of religion, maybe. And it's just embedded in our cultures and our way of living and in, in our just in the day to day. And so it's really interesting when those pieces are asked to be taken out or are asked to be toned down. Um, yeah, it's, it's and that sometimes so so when we're talking about the fourth door and we're getting these editing suggestions, we have to be really mindful about like what is that perspective that would ask you know, cultures to tone it themselves down. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that can be kind of a, a terrible reality of this publishing industry is that it really isn't one that has really decolonized or walked its talk mm -hmm. around um, equity and diversity as much as it needs to. Yeah, I would agree with that actually. And it's unfortunate. I mean, I would say that some publishers are moving uh, very solidly in that direction. Yeah. Uh, it's just, they're gonna be the, the leaders, the vanguard of this, hopefully, and hopefully everyone will come along eventually. We are gonna go to some more audience questions very soon, but um, this was the question I wanted to ask, and it's a little silly, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. And that is, uh, you know, where do stories come from? Why do they come at all? Uh, what, if you had to say overall, is the reason that you feel, you feel this uh, compulsion to write stories or do you even understand it? Because <laughs> it's fair if you don't, I'm not 100% I, sure I do. Farzana, do you want to talk? I can answer this one. Go ahead, easily. go ahead. Um, I've always, even before I could write, I told stories and my family were storytellers. Um, my, my, both my parents were born in Italy. My father was uh, from, um, the, the Alps in the name of the Rose Country, if you've ever read that Umberto Eco book. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather uh, would get, when you know he was still living there, would get snowed up, snowed in in the high mountain passes with livestock and I guess his brothers and whoever else was up there. And, and they, they basically would you know keep themselves sane by telling stories. And they did have a whole raft of kind of what we would think of as classic fairy tales but they were always sort of darker and sexier and more violent, <laughs> like as they were Italian. Um, so when I was a kid, I mean, all my siblings too, you know, our nono would tell, tell us these stories all the time. So it was kind of almost like, um, um, like a survival skill or a craft. It was sort of something you were able to do the way you were able to grow something or build something or fix something is that you knew how to tell us a good story. And my mom's side, the same thing. They were a little different. The stories were always, again, they sort of had this uh, Oprah Buffa kind of feel to them where they would be, you know, would always be taking sometimes something that had happened that was when you thought about it really awful and making it um, funny or making it seem like it was that the, that the family came out on top in the end. It's called in Italian, fa la bella figura. You're making the beautiful picture. So I grew up always, you know, spending enormous amounts of time either hearing these, these sexy violent fairy tales I'm from one side of the family, and then hearing these kind of um, operatic versions of real stories. And I think that I just started, I started telling stories to other kids, I started telling stories to my cousins, and then being told not to tell them stories, because I keep them awake at night. And then I started writing them down when I was little. So I think it was a cultural thing, actually. Okay. You know, to Farzana's point, these stories were not sort of realistic stories. They were taken and created into something bigger than what, what the, the ingredients were to make mm -hmm. them a good story. Okay, yeah. yeah. Farzana, what do you yeah. think about I, that? I, I think this is probably embedded in, in different manifestations in all of our cultures. Maybe it's like a human thing that stories are the ways that we entertain ourselves, but it's also how we make sense of the world, right? How it's, how we learn new things. So um, in terms of like why I have an interest in doing it though, it is a little bit more mysterious for me because, 
Yeah, I, as a kid, I was writing poetry. I was writing plays. Um, some of that stopped as I got to university because I went off in a different direction. And then, um, you know, in my late 20s, I started to write again. And it does feel kind of like a compulsion. It feels a little addictive almost, um, okay. that if I don't do it um, for a day or two, I start to feel kind of itchy, yeah. like something is wrong. And then I feel a great comfort. Like if I can write, you know, if I have a good writing session, I feel like I've had a workout or something. So um, compulsive is a good word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can agree with that. I've been not doing much lately because I was focusing on the launch of the new book and I just keep thinking when when is the day going to come when am I going to have that two three hour stretch in the afternoon where I can actually work on something new uh, it's just it's a compulsion that a lot of people actually have and um leading into actually it's, it's not quite it's like it's just a couple of minutes away from audience question time but we've got one that is kind of the same as a pre-submitted question so we're talking about the need to do it. I'll read them both just so you can hear the different phrasing. One was, um, I have all these stories inside me. How do I get them out? And the other is, what steps would you recommend for an aspiring writer to get started? Because surely there are so many of us who feel like we have stories that we want to tell and wouldn't know the first step at all to putting pen to paper, figuratively speaking. Do you have any advice for, for these, these two people, probably many more out there who have that question in mind? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you just start. You just start and you write whatever it is that's coming. Um, you don't worry too much if the first drafts are really ugly. All of my first drafts are really ugly. Um, and you just, you just get started. Um, once you have gotten started, um, maybe think about engaging with the writer community a little bit, take some workshops. Every single writer's festival offers um, free workshops. Um, there's usually writer in residences at most libraries that yeah. you can connect with. So, so start getting your skills up, but also build your community. Find the other writers so that they can help you to take all those next steps because it does get kind of tricky like figuring out how to get published all that kind of stuff those are those are a lot of steps but I would say you just start writing right. you make the time you do it yeah I I, I absolutely agree there's just no it, it is in some ways terribly complicated and terribly simple the terribly simple part is you have to sit down and write and there's no, and, it, and the experience of what makes it easy to do that for different people is different. Mm -hmm. There are some writers who need to have like a real routine. They have to be in the same room. They have to wear the same clothes. They have to, they have to write at the same time of day. I tend not to be like that. Um, but, you know, you sort of find out what it is that, it, that helps you. I mean, there are people who find it's helpful to listen to certain kinds of music mm -hmm. to get them into kind of almost an altered state because for a lot of us, I don't think this is unusual, especially when you're writing first drafts, you are sort of in an altered state. So just let yourself go and do it. But if you don't, you know, you have to take a chance. It's a, it's a risk taking thing. You might write something that, you know, you probably will write something that, that isn't publishable, but almost nothing is publishable the first time through. I mean, writing really is revision. Yeah. It's the crafting that happens afterwards. So. You know, the other, and I would agree, Farzana, like, I think it's really helpful to take workshops and there are lots of um, places that you can do that. Um, but yeah, and the other thing I would say is do not mistake how do I get started writing with how do I get published? Um, because if you start going down that road, you know, you're skipping forward too many steps. The first yeah. thing is to is to write. Oh, and I would throw one other piece of advice and then I will stop talking on this point. Read, 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 read. I've had yes. some emerging writers or want to like want to want to be writers say to me, I really have I have this story I really want to write. And I'll say, oh, you should read, I don't know, Louise Erdrich. She she writes some sort of similar things. And they'll say, oh, I never read. I don't have time to read. And yeah. <laughs> if you are a writer, you really need to be a reader. Um, it's yeah. how you, it's actually, I think, how the probably one of the most important ways to learn to be a writer. Yeah, yeah. I, agree. I, I, I agree. agree with that. Absolutely.
Um, it's also a way to get started. Like I sometimes, if I'm feeling just a little bit stuck, like I'll open up a poetry book and I'll, I'll read a poem and yeah. it helps me to access that part of my brain that does want to go into that slight trancey place. So it's also a nice way to get yourself to sit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had a couple questions about kind of the business side of things. And uh, I think there's probably something we can say there. Uh, one person wondered if most published writers have formal writing training, like courses or taking part in, in workshops. And we talked about that's things that people can do. But do you think most most published writers do? I think it really varies myself. Um, my first novel I was published, I didn't have anything like that other than like a high school creative writing course uh, but I'd always been writing however poorly when I was 12 I was always writing these things um, what do you think in your experiences I think that there's a range hey yeah. Um, yeah. but um, you don't you don't have to have I think you don't have to have that formal education to um, learn how to write because it is a practice, as Terry said, the real writing is the revision, it's the editing, it's the it's the staying with it and working at it. Those workshops that I mentioned are just helpful, I think, for connecting to the writer world and mm -hmm. um, learning about possibilities, like um, learning learning about opportunities even. So, I mean, they're useful, but um, you don't have to have the formal education. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything. <laughs> I think you learn you learn a lot about, I mean, I think it, it is useful if you are at the point where you have a pro, you, you're, you've been writing and you have some, you know, some pages and you think, what is, I don't even know what this is. Is this a novel? Is it a short story? Should I be writing a memoir? You know, I, but you've got something. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time it really is helpful to, to, to do a workshop. Um, because it does, you know, and share it with people. Um, and a lot of the time, if you do have a good group or you have a good um, mentor in, and there are some terrific ones out there, they will help you sort of see what it could be. And mm -hmm. sometimes it can be the smallest little thing that they say that can help you that way. But I mean, there are writers who have MFAs in creative writing. Um, I don't, I've, as I say, I've written all my life. I was writing for the the, the daily newspaper in St. Catharines when I was still in high school. So I had been always been writing and I, I'm a, I write for in my career too. I'm a copywriter. So, and content writer. So I also write, you know, a, a different kind of writing, which I wouldn't consider particularly creative, but to sell things, but you still are honing the craft of, um, of how to put words together mm -hmm. and have an, and have an emotional impact and communicate with people. So yeah. that's, that can be helpful too. So there are mm -hmm. a lot of journalists who, for example, will start to write novels because there is crossover in those, in those professions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think both of you mentioned workshops. I think meeting other writers and talking to other writers, first of all, you're going to find them surprisingly willing to do so. At yeah. least I certainly did. One of the reasons I started my radio show was because as I was a new author at the age of 46, I'm coming out writing a book, and everyone was so willing to uh, let me talk their ear off and give advice. I mean, we ha we've had questions submitted about what does the road to publishing look like? How do I find a literary agent? Um, and I don't know that that there is an, a singular answer for for those types of questions at all, because I know all three of our journeys to getting our books out there have been like wildly different. And, um, and I think maybe just meeting and talking with uh, individuals, firing off an email, most people are happy now. Not that I'm inviting them to email you guys, because I'm not going to take it that far, but <laughs> certainly getting to, to talk to people who've been through it, I think, is, uh, is very valuable. I think, would you yes. agree with that? Surely you had some, if not, not mentors, but people who uh, nudged you along as you first started. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that yeah. if for the public, for the publishing, when people start asking questions about publishers and the road to publishing and agents, and I do get people emailing me those questions, mm -hmm. and I have a standard answer for that, which is take a course. There are workshops that are not about writing. They are about, here's what the publishing process looks like. 
here's what you're going to need to do. Here's how you write a query letter. Here's how you find, you know, here's where you look to see whether this agent or this publisher is a good fit. So really, you know, and I know, for example, the Humber School for Writers um, is, is, I did a summer program there once years ago, and it's like a brain dump of here's how the business works. I would really, if someone really wants to know that specifically, there are places you can go and it's well worth the investment of your time to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you're nodding in agreement. Yeah, like that's 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 a it's a very big question, and there are plenty of of places to get that information. Um, yeah, I think we all have had different paths, and you have to you have to be part of a writer's community, I think, to be able to navigate this stuff. And when I say writer's community, it 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 could just be going to the workshops. But one of the things I did a little bit like you, Jamie, was. After my first novel came out, I really didn't know very many writers. I started the Brockton Writers Series and I curated that for nine years. And I got to meet so many people and have so many great conversations and so many doors opened after that. So mm -hmm. volunteer, yeah. if you wanna publish yeah. a book, volunteer. There's so many places to volunteer. It's all yeah. run by volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. Thankfully, there are people willing to do it. Well, I do my show on a volunteer basis. I'm not. I'm not paid to do that. Um, and of course, through that show, I've met a lot of people. Not everyone's going to start a podcast, though. Uh, but I can go back to 2015, and I was hoping to publish. I didn't know yet, but I found community just by going to uh, the Great Lit Festival here in Hamilton, and I just sort of someone introduced themselves and started talking and I, maybe I found the right person in the room because it was uh, Krista Foss and she was wonderful and just introduced me to all these people in the same evening. But yeah, you don't have to do something big. You can just go to events. There's tons of events yep. in, in your town. I can almost guarantee it, even small towns, you know, um, and that's where you can meet people. And again, just, it's hard. It's sometimes scary to introduce yourself, but uh, we're, we're, we're a whole bunch of nerds, us writers. We're not intimidating, I really. I think you can easily <laughs> talk to any of us <laughs> and we'd be happy to chat with you. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, finding that community, uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of ways to do it. And I think it's, yeah, it's going to help you out so much. And not even necessarily with the business stuff, maybe with the, the story things. Like, like some of the questions we've talked about tonight are questions that people have. And, and it's nice to be able to talk to someone else who might have gone through that same uh, sequence of problems or, or, or challenges, and they're gonna be a great, you know, a great resource for you. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. Um, do, here's another question from, from the audience. Do, you, do any of you dedicate time to allow for creativity, downtime from writing to relax and let inspiration come or does the act of writing fuel the imagination for you and sit I down, you sit down and work sit down. <laughs> yeah you're not wrong for, for me i i like to um write a bit and then like take a walk mm -hmm. or do something take a little break and sometimes um, some connections will happen during the break. So I'll have been wrestling with a particular plot issue or character issue, and then a beautiful idea arrives when I stop thinking about it. So yes, yeah, sit down and write, and then take your break. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually do agree with that. In fact, I think I wrote yeah. a blog once called I Write With My Feet, because um, I find, especially if I'm stuck, um, actually physical, some doing something physical and going for a walk or, or cycling or something like that can sometimes, you're not thinking about the problem anymore and then it just, oh, I could do that. So you no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, I think it's, it's the same. I have to sit down and do it for, for the juices to really start flowing. Um, but they don't stop after you like had your had your two hours are up. You know, yeah. you go to work or to pick up the kids or whatever thing it is you have to do, and suddenly things are popping into your brain because you've spent so much mental energy on this. That energy is still flowing around there, and it's fascinating. Sometimes you'll be. Um, Sometimes I'll take my phone and pretend that I'm talking to somebody, but I'm just doing a voice note so I remember <laughs> for later. 
know, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, it's, uh, it's really interesting. I think you do have to allow yourself some sort of time. I think if you get too keyed up and too intense about it, that, that can, uh, I'm, my brain anyway will lock up on me and I have to step back for a, a little bit and get a little sad about things and breathe and, and allow the ideas to formulate, but still they really come together at the keyboard for me. Yeah, I mean, there, sure. are, there are some writers, and I try to do this, although I find it hard, who find it good to write something and then put it away and not look at it for like, I don't know, three months or something, um, and then come back to it. And then you're reading it as if you, and you don't even remember what you've written anymore. So you're able to judge it more objectively. Um, but I find it difficult to not look at something for that long. But, you know, sometimes I'll, just because of life, I won't look at it for a week. And I find even oh. just, having those little gaps are really helpful because yeah. you know you forget what you've done. Yeah. And then you come back and oh, that either that's good or that sucks. Or like you can <laughs> somehow you have a better sense of it when you haven't looked at it all constantly. Yeah. Uh, we really only have time, I think, for one more question. So I'm going to pick another audience question that uh, I think is actually fairly easy to answer, uh, but we can elaborate a little bit. Do you write, do you type, do you use Scrivener, do you use Word Perfect, do you use a pen and paper? What is, the, what is your most effective way of physically writing? Either uh, of you can. I could answer that dif different, different books have wanted different things. Uh, my last novel, um, I wrote many, many scenes in a notebook, 15 minutes in the morning with my cup of coffee. That was sort of how so, so much of that got started. Um, but I mostly just use Microsoft Word. I'm pretty simple about um, that. I, I used to use Scrivener, but I found it too complicated for me. Um, me too. So yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I compose at the keyboard. Um, I started doing that when I was very young because I was constantly being criticized for my terrible handwriting uh, when I was in school. And so I taught myself the keyboard when I was very young and I try not to handwrite too much. Um, I do, but I also do something similar to Farzana. I have a lot of notebooks and I find sometimes, especially because I tend to sometimes wake up for whatever reason early in the morning and suddenly will have worked out a problem. And rather than immediately go and turn my laptop on and sit down, I will, I will write it out. But I tend to compose um, at the keyboard. Mm -hmm. But there are writers who actually still do everything by hand and then and then key it in and actually find the process of keying in from handwriting really helps them with revision. I think it would drive me crazy, but um, again, it really depends. Yeah, it does. I wrote, uh, my handwriting is also terrible, terrible. And I, my hand cramps after like two paragraphs and I still wrote an entire book um, sort of in the pre-laptop days in the back of a van on tour with a ska band. Life is weird, <laughs> but <laughs> but it really depends. And, and I've never done it that way before or since. I typed when I was a, a little kid. But we, um, Christine has asked me to let everyone know that uh, we are out of time Aww. for the evening. And uh, so just to wrap things up, I want to say thank you so much to Farzana and Terry for being here tonight having these uh, great conversations hopefully we answered some questions out there that people might have had either about uh, where stories come from or some of the other uh, nuts and bolts questions that we had and we want to thank of course the great christine for sending us up and dave in the tech area over there area i'm pointing like he's physically <laughs> there but you know and to all of you thank you so much for uh, for spending your uh, hour with us tonight and I hope that you really enjoyed yourselves and we will see you next time.